with its three weeks of racing around France, up and down mountains at breakneck speed, the Tour de France is without doubt one of the toughest sporting events in the world. But few of us will ever get the chance to experience what the Tour de France is actually like, how fast it is and how grueling and demanding this race actually is. So to lift the lid on what the race is actually like and how tough and demanding it is, I sat down for a conversation with Christian Vanderveld, a rider who finished a career best of fourth place in the Tour de France. And I started by asking him to put into words how tough the race really is. It is very hard to put into words. Dude. Um, the best way to put it for me is that now that I work in TV and I'm commenting on what I used to do, I don't know how I ever did that or why I ever did that. I mean, I have, I am, I'm lucky to still be in awe and still be such a fan of the sport. And I think that would, that's what I love doing my job as much as I do, but it really is hard to put into words while, while you're doing it and you're so fit and, and just singly focused on one task at hand that is surviving every day or exceeding or doing some kind of team efforts. Um, it doesn't seem as crazy, but when you're on the other side of the fence, it just seems ungodly what these guys put themselves through it. And it's really not just the physical, the difference between the tour de France and the other grand tours is the all encompassing stresses and pressures that are put on. There's 10 X amount of fans, 10 X amount of people throwing water, air horns in your hair and helicopters over your head. So the stress on your central nervous system alone, just before you even pedal your bike is already 10 X what you do. You know, the, the fact that we're even talking about this, we're not going to have this kind of conversation before the Vuelta, you know, we're not, it's just not going to happen. We don't, there's just not the same eyes on it. But how on earth do you prepare for that? I mean, obviously you've got this sort of physical preparation, what training you do, but how do you prepare for the Tour of France when it's your first time and you've got the crowds and the press and like pressure and stress on you? Can you prepare yeah, I, for that? I don't think you can prepare for it. I, I think it's just a, a, a lifetime of, of being involved in the sport and, you know, being, it's it's the holy grail of for cycling. There really is for better for worse, right? Well, I wish we had more that were, could at least push the Tour de France for being equally as big. But that's really the you know it's it's the pinnacle of the sport. So as far as preparing for it, no, not not really. I don't think anyone's really ready to see what it looks like to be in the Pyrenees or in the Alps when there's crazy bass people in, in on your land. I mean, it's 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 crazy and it's it's a lot of fun and it makes the sport so much better of course, but, um, and makes it that it's, there's nothing else like it. There's no other sport in the world, maybe rally car or something like that, where you can get as close, but you don't want to get close with a, a car going by 200 kilometers per hour. But, uh, I think that is, that's one of the biggest differentiators that makes it so unique. Now I can barely imagine getting around the course, let alone actually racing it and trying to compete for stage wins with GC. So how do you ensure you're fit enough for it, but also fit enough to be able to do team tactics and be on the peloton all day and then going for stage wins. How do you, you know, prepare yourself for that? Yeah. I, I mean, the, the biggest thing that I'm in awe is, is just the average rider and, and how strong communally the entire peloton is. And that's what's made it so much more stressful inside the peloton and so much more dangerous because you're all fighting for the same 10 feet of tarmac on the front of the road. And there's only so much room for, maybe 10 to 12 people side by side, shoulder to shoulder, all the way across the road. Uh, and the difference, and I, I, my last tour was 2013. It wasn't that long ago. Okay. It, it is for some of these younger guys. They're only 12, you know, Tade was only 12 years old, not even 12 <laughs> years old at the time. Um, but really it's, it's changed so quickly. And uh, it's, I think that's what has brought some more, more eyeballs to sports. It's professionalized the amount of money that's going into it. Um, but that's been the biggest difference for me. If I'm really looking at the tour and biggest change is that it isn't just five or six or 10 or 15 or 20 people at the top of a, a big climb, there's 40 to 50 to 60 people going over at the same time. And it's just so much makes it so much more dynamic. Um, it's almost like when golf, if you, if you are any golf fans out there, when Tiger Woods and everyone's just started bombing drives and they had to start making the the course is longer and the and changing where the sand traps were and, and all these kind of things. And the same thing happens a lot with, with cycling as well. Whereas sometimes the biggest differences aren't made on the biggest climbs. They could be in the more dynamic intermediate climbs. And those are the days that, you know, maybe aren't as sexy when you're looking at them from afar, but they could have some of the best racing because it's so hard to make the difference. But you're saying it's, it's stepped up even more since you retired and 
the racing got more competitive or and would you say it's more of a level playing field now and you know more riders competing for more stage wins during the race yes i mean we're we're having standout performances you know especially with the the new generation um and i think that has a lot to do with technology as well where a lot of these younger pros have been training like they were a seasoned professional in their teens um and with better access to technology and, and better training than i ever had in my entire career maybe when i was it took me uh, a decade or more of being a professional to learn the tricks of the trade whereas these guys already had that in the iphone when they start off when they're 18 years old so i think that's when been one of the biggest changes and then of course through the pandemic everyone got to start training like they were the leader of their team and that changed things <laughs> exponentially over the last two years as well um so can you tell us how many times you started tour france and how many times you finished and can you tell us about sort of a standout memory from doing a tour of France during your career. I started 11 tours. I finished eight of them, um, broke quite a few bones during the mix. Um, never got to finish those ones. I, and it, I'm glad I was hurt badly enough that I couldn't keep on, you know, limping my way through to Paris. And, and I always had the mentality, if I couldn't really make a difference, I didn't want to be there anyway. So th those days, of course, I would have loved to have finished, but there was no way. Uh, Standout years, I mean, 99 with when Lance won his first tour was was pretty crazy, especially being that being my first Tour de France. Um, and then pushing forward to 2008 when I had a standout performance and I got, ended up being fourth place that year. Um, have a lot of great memories of that. But honestly, so many different ones. I mean, riding for Fabian Cancellara, uh, in 2007 with the yellow jersey for, for so many days, uh, the stage in, in London where he actually just smashed it. I don't know how he ever went <laughs> as fast as he did around downtown London. I, I, we watched the video actually last month and it, it was just in, incredible to see. So that was a lot of fun being able to ride for the yellow jersey in England that year. And that was absolutely bonkers. Not as crazy it was in 2014, but still was pretty nuts. Um, but that the tour is just a special, special place. Uh, this year started in Denmark is going to be incredible. I mean, anytime you go to a foreign country, which usually happens every other year, it's been a little bit different through the pandemic, but it changes everything because they only have three days to take it all in. Whereas the tour, you know, they get it every year in, in France, obviously. And the fact that it's going to Copenhagen and Denmark and how frothy they are for the sport of cycling in such a small, small country, but produces some of the most incredible athletes in cycling. So I think that is going to be a spectacle in itself. Um, but the tour itself this year, it's so dynamic. And I keep on saying that over and over, but it truly is. It, it has almost a theme that changes every three days where it starts in Denmark. It's flat, um, could be windy depending on where, what mother nature has in store. And then Northern France and then the Ardennes and a little bit of tour of Flanders for three days. And then right back kind of almost into the mountains early on. So you already get into, into some high Alps already in the first week, which is a little bit strange. And so, you know, in the past, you'd always have so many sprint stages and that, that was it for 10 days, you had sprinters and they were most likely Mario Cipollini in the yellow jersey. And then, <laughs> and then in the big mountains and those guys barely made it. And then have the transition stages, which were, you know, the best days to take a nap for, you know, four hours and wake back up for the last sprint. And then a, a time trial in Paris, you know, and that was it. Uh, I think now it's just every day uh, something can and will happen. And then the cliches always come out with, you know, you can't win the tour in the first week, but you can definitely lose it. Absolutely. Yeah. I remember like being a kid and watching a tour of France and you fall asleep for the first few hours, when the breakaway <laughs> out there. And then, but these days, like the racing seems to be like, fast from the gun and you, like the first few hours almost as exciting as the last few hours Agreed. of sprint finish so that's definitely a big transition so you finished fourth which is an amazing result top 10 top five and you've been on a winning team not many pro riders actually get to be on a winning tour of front team so that must change you know, how you tackle the race and how you view the race and how you remember the race as a retired athlete being on a winning team and then top four as well yeah and i was lucky enough to have a very well-rounded career as far as many years being a domestique and then almost being thrust. I wasn't a, a natural leader by any stress of the imagination, but I was just pretty much pushed into that position later in my career as well. So I had a, a good understanding what it was like to work for somebody for days on end and really 
appreciate and support those guys who do those the hard yards before any of the, the leaders get to do, do their thing at the end. Um, so yeah, I have a, always had a, a well-rounded appreciation of, of everyone, you know, how hard it is to have all that pressure on your shoulders, but also at the same time, how hard it is to ride 200 K and, and then everyone asks you, well, why did you lose 25 minutes, David? Did you have a bad day? You're like, no, I was on the front <laughs> for 120 miles. So they have, you know, have all that appreciation. I mean, the amount of phone calls that I got from my father before we had good TV, uh, <laughs> viewing ship is like, Oh, did, did something happen? Are you okay? I saw you lost 30 minutes. Like, no, I, I had a great day actually. And just to explain that kind of thing. So I have a good appreciation of, of the, the broader sex, but part of the sport for sure. Yeah. And did it get, I mean, the first tour of France must be an absolute sort of unknown quantity in terms of how your boy responds to it. And hopefully you've done a train for it. Is that the hardest Tour de France you do? Is the last one, the easy one, you've got experience, you know what to do? Or is it always as hard as everyone different in a different sort of way, given the course and the, and the variables involved? I would say but one of the first ones is the easiest because I had zero pressure on myself. Okay. You know, I, I wasn't even supposed to finish the race. I was just a young kid coming from a track background. I had great form. Um, I ended up being the best young rider jersey. Well, actually, we didn't have a jersey. This gave me flowers at the time. There's no white <laughs> at the time, unfortunately. Uh, and then, and then, yeah, of course, be, being able to have the leadership on the team always helps you. When you have no, I would say the hardest Grand Tours is when everything goes wrong within your team, and then you have no reason to live, and you're just you're just pretty much pack fodder, more or less, and getting from point A to point B, and just trying to finish a race and that those are easily the worst. And then we had one or two of those in the Giro d'Italia, which were excruciating. It's absolutely horrible when you, but when you are have great morale on a team, you're suffering the same. You are probably suffering even more because you're going deeper into the race, but it makes it, you're a part of it. You're, you're making a difference within the race and uh, you have a reason to get up in the morning, not just trudging your way through a 200 K stage in, in the Dolomites, just, just to finish to make it to Milan. So yeah, I'd say that the hardest days are really when you got the worst results. And how do you pick yourself up when you have a bad day, your legs aren't working or you have an injury, you have to keep going. Cause that's one thing about pro cyclists. They, they crash, break themselves and pick themselves up and carry on riding, which seems you know, superhuman and crazy perhaps, but, but how do you pick yourself up sort of mentally and physically to keep going? And like, cause a team effort as well. And it's a, not letting yourself down and letting the team down and must be tough. And, to... Yeah. And everyone at home, all the people who have sacrificed so much to be your, your wife, your kids that you haven't seen. So the, there's so much that goes into this, that it's not just that you trained the week before you're getting ready for. It. I mean, it is the entire year. So when you see someone truly step off their bike, it must be bad. And usually in the Tour de France, I mean, there's no worse place you want to be is if you don't have form or if you're truly hurt as in the Tour de France, when you have the highest speeds and the most pressure on yourself. Um, but I think it's the easiest race to continue to try to push it and try to make it to the finish line because you have put so much effort into it and your teams has put to effort and there's so much to gain and lose on it. So yeah, if there's, if there's any stage race throughout the year that you want to try to make it to the finish line, of course, the, the big leaders, if they're not winning, there's no reason for them to be there. They, they need to get out as soon as possible and try to recover and try to do something for the, the Vuelta España, for example. But in case of Primoz Roglic last year, right? Yeah. Um, but everyone else, it's, it's pretty different. Yeah, because like you say, it's, it's a, the pinnacle of our sport. And then for a lot of riders who aren't going to actually win it, just getting around and getting to Paris is going to be the peak of their career, isn't it? They might not sure. win, but it's, you know, they can tell their parents, grandparents, they, they rode into Paris. With the rest of you. So it must be quite um quite a motivational thing to just get to Paris, whatever injuries or form you're not you know, carrying. Yeah, there's there's no I mean to be able to finish in Milan, to be able to finish in Madrid, to be able to finish in, in Paris, there's not too many better feelings, but nothing comes close to the Champs Elysees. And when, especially if you're on the podium, we we won the team overall in 2011 and be able to to get, be taking pictures up there and be with your team as well. Um, and then of course, you know, your family usually meets you out there at a big party, all that, all that crescendo. Um, the worst was always, you know, your friends and family saying, Oh, I booked tickets to come see you. And this is like May or June. You're like, don't, Oh my goodness. And then it's even more, even more pressure than, and now I need to make it to the finish line. Yeah. That's, that's quite unique pressure. That is having the family there waiting for you. 
we bought yeah. our tickets and we're here waiting for you. <laughs> <laughs> um, so fitness, obviously, a, a key element to the Tour of France, um, removing whatever sort of variables of you know, stress and pressure from the peloton and media. How fit do you need to be to ride a Tour of France? Can you put a number on it? Is it a simple case of having a certain FTP or wattage output? No, I can't put a not not for just the average rider to be able to be be in the the race in general. Because let's say you're one of the best sprinters, maybe your FTP is not that amazing. Okay, it's it's for the average person, even the sprinters. Okay, this is a good lesson. Everyone who thinks that oh, there's a sprinters in the group pedal, ninety nine percent of the people could never be in the group head of, I mean, they can still go quite fast just to finish the race within the time limit. Um, so just the average ride, yes, you have to, all those guys still have easily, you know, five Watts per kilo climb in, climb out. Um, but to make the difference now, and again, back to what I was saying earlier, the difference that was from just 10 years ago to what it is today. Um, the fact that they keep continuing to break records on every climb that they race over, and, and, and what you're alluding to as well, it's not just the last hour of racing where you could go take a nap for three or four hours. It's, <laughs> it's what they do in the first climb, the second climb, and all, all the way throughout the day and what they do in the crosswinds in between the climbs. Um, it's it just full gas racing. And so if you are resting your laurels that I'm doing the same numbers that I did last year and I did well in the tour, well, you probably are going backwards because everyone every year gets a little bit better. And it's not just the leaders, it's the entire Peloton. So it's, it's a pressure cooker these days for sure. And how much your fitness changed during the three weeks? I mean, do you start with a high level of fitness and you just kind of hold onto it or do you ride yourself fit? Is it the one approach that works best or is it whatever works different riders? You know, I, I don't, I don't know if you could, I don't think, I think that's, that's another statement of the past that I don't know if you could ride yourself into fitness because that you don't have the days where you're just plodding along on the bike, like I just mentioned. So if you're not sharp on day one, most likely you're going to go backwards and you're just going to get beat up so bad throughout those first 10 days that you're not going to be able to recover. Um, there's a difference between reaching that peak peak fitness or, or carrying that peak fitness into the third week. Cause a lot of times if you look at a calendar, even as we sit here, a week and a half before the Tour de France starts, a little bit less. The last week of races in the Pyrenees and the time trial, that is eons away still. So we, whenever you look at that kind of view of where, where you want to be at your best, sometimes you really have to realize that you, you need to pull the reins in just a little bit when every athlete, more is better all the time, right? But sometimes coming into a big race is you just want to be fresh. You want to be healthy first and foremost, especially when we're talking about with Corona going on. And then, of course, you want to have those reserves. So making sure that you're, you're topped up with your food, you're not trying to eke everything out of your body in the, in the last week, cramming for the test. Yeah, I mean, I haven't done a Tour of France, obviously, but I've done a few multi-day rides where you, know, you start off fresh and the second day you get retired and the third day. For me, that recovery from the first day and making sure your legs are as fresh as the first day, for the second day, third day, is really difficult. Is that just because my nutrition recovery is pretty rubbish and the pro rides have it down to a kind of fine art? So... And, and do you wake up every day feeling fresh or you just absolutely tired, dragging yourself out of bed and, but you had that immense fitness that like you just turned the pedals. Oh, is- hell no, man. You do not <laughs> wake up fresh. I mean, I mean, that, that was always, that was one of the biggest revelations to myself is that I, I thought that you just get back to the hotel and just, you know, try to be in bed by 10 o'clock. And there's no way. I mean, first of all, you just have so much more to do. Like we were talking about with, you know, journalism, press, people trying to write letters, talking to people. Um, and the fact that you don't even get back to your hotel till six thirty, seven o'clock. And by the time everyone gets through massage, go and see a Cairo or physio dinner, try to cool down. You, you pray to God that you have air conditioning in your room, that you can actually be cool in the room. Uh, the amount of times you wake up in the middle of the night and take a, a shower at three o'clock in the morning, just to, to cool yourself down. Wow. Um, obviously that has changed a little bit more. Most in the modern day, most people should have air conditioning, but they still don't once in a while. And it still could be a big, you know, everyone's at the end of the tour should have the same amount of points when it comes to hotels. So there's a point system. So you might be in a beautiful chateau one day, but the next day you could be in a campanile, right? So, but the next day you're just hoping that everything works out in the right progression. So if you have a rest day or two days in the hotel, you hope that it's a nice one. Um, so it, it should all 
supposedly even out in the wash, but depending <laughs> on what days those are, you know, and, and how you're recovering. But I would say the biggest thing we recover is inflammation though. It's, it's quite easy to, um, to actually gain weight during the tour de France, just cause you're, you're mostly just inflamed. And so the more, more of inflammation, you're carrying that kind of water and to feel good on the bike. Sometimes it takes hours to get all that, that water out of your, your body and start really firing on all cylinders. So being able to keep there, minimize that as much as possible. I think that's one of the biggest hurdles there is in the tour. That surprised me that you say you put on weight. Cause I mean, we all know that on average, you burn 6,000, 8,000 calories a stage, depending on the whether it's a mountain or a time trial. So it must be impossible to eat enough food you know, on the bike and off the bike to maintain sort of a healthy weight to make sure your, you know, your muscles have all the energy you need. But you're saying that you actually actually gain uh, yeah, weight. But, yeah, don't don't get me wrong. I'm, I'm not saying you're getting fat. You just retain enough You have so much inflation. Okay. Inflammation, excuse me, inside your body that you, you retain all that water. Okay. And that, that, that is the, the one of the, could be some of the biggest hurdles, especially when you're pushing into the Pyrenees in the third week of the Tour de France. So it's all about managing that. And, and I guess that's about massaging and all those sort of remedies to try and. Yeah. And, mo- and mostly nutrition. And again, I, I didn't, I didn't allude to that um, earlier. We we're talking about mostly training, but I think nutrition has been one of the biggest hindrances in the past. And now if we just opened up a Pandora's box of what the body and how fast you recover afterwards, we have so many, everyone talking about ketones. There's it's, it's truly endless out there. Um, especially on the recovery side. Has that been a, a big kind of step forward from your career to what they, they have available to them now and the nutrition available that they're making it easier for them to race at a high level then with the nutrition. I, so. I mean, put it this way, David, I mean, this is it's kind of funny to think of, but, in 99, we were the first team to have a chef on our team. You were at the mercy of whatever hotel and what they happened to have for dinner that night. I mean, how <laughs> archaic and insane is that? You know, that was 22 years ago, but it's not that long. Now everyone has a chef. Everyone makes sure that those the food is, is properly prepared for them. And it's not just what the, the chef just decides to make pasta every night, well, that, which was on, in our case. At least we knew we weren't going to get food poisoning. And that was really the only reason we had that. And then now it, it, there's a reason for it. Okay, how hard of a stage is it going to be tomorrow? What, what was it today? This is going to set the course of the menu. So yeah, I, I think a, a massive shift is definitely being in nutrition, both on, on on the bike as well. I still find it bizarre that you you stay in random hotels around France. There might be a chateau one day or a very basic one star hotel the next, which seems crazy given how high tech the sport is in every other regard. That you're at the mercy of these hotels and no air conditioning. That you must have experienced some pretty bad hotels. Oh man, <laughs> some, some bad ones. And a lot of times, the funniest thing is really some of the chateaus were the worst, you know, because they usually wouldn't have air conditioning, you know. So if it was a hot day, then you're you're going to get the beat down. So some teams even brought. I mean, some you have teams that have a team just within the team that brings their own mattresses, like Quick Step. Uh, yeah. Sky did the same thing. Ineos did the same thing. Um, that that's a, a big change. I mean, at least you could have, you know, the, the same feeling that you're in your own bed, your own bedding. I think they still do that in EOS. Um, they went as far as to have individual washer and dryers for each, every rider. So supposedly they, they couldn't, I don't wow. know. That, that, that seemed a little too much and a little voodoo for me to have eight washers and dryers, but say la vie. And they, they won a lot, so they could do whatever they want. Now, I know racing changed a bit for when you were racing, but can you give us an idea of what you'd eat on the bike during a typical six-hour stage and then what you'd eat after the bike? Well, when we, when in the Slipstream organization, which turned into Garmin, um, we were a little bit ahead of the curve on on-bike nutrition. And so we, at the time, really thought the maximum that your gut could absorb is right around 350 calories. So mm-hmm. that you know so mostly carbohydrate almost all carbohydrates obviously so what is that that's probably right around uh 80 yeah 80 ish 80 to 90 uh, grams of carbohydrate but we now know that these guys could do much more than that and they're bringing up to around 500 calories per hour um and it's not only in the racing it's in the training and i think that's been a massive shift of being how much they've been able to consume and again, we're talking about recovery. So if you're not in such a deficit and you're holding on to that, you don't have to 
then we in the past we'd overeat after the bike and that's a, your uh, body yeah. insulin levels everything just completely out of whack so i think that's been a massive shift of shift of what they've been able to consume on the bike and how they consumed it just because there's so much more calories and carbohydrates being able being available in carbohydrate form in your water bottle uh, where we used to have maybe 120 calories in a bottle they could have up to you know 320 now even more okay yeah a big change because um i know from personal experience i'm sure lots of viewers you know doing a short ride compared to a long ride is very different in terms of nutrition sometimes your stomach just can't handle all the yeah. gel and start pumping down it so i guess every ride is different in terms of what they can actually manage to kind of stomach literally during a long stage and then doing it over three weeks must be another sort of unknown unless you've done a few tour of france you know what you can actually get down your down your mouth <laughs> yeah it's true i mean you you have to train your gut just as much as you you train your body and that's part of the process as well Be, you know you're not going to try out a new product the first day or the first day in the mountains in the tour de france you haven't tried out many times in training um so being able to consume those kind of calories and still have the appetite in the third week so many people just can't eat anymore or if you know if i if i have a specific brand of bar to this day, I, I will get literally sick to my stomach because I've, I've had to push them down my throat so many times at the wrong times in my career. So uh, that is part of the game though, being able to eat your way all the way through and still have that appetite deep into the third week. And you can see a person a mile away, if they're not eating well in the third week, it's over, game, set, match. Very bad. So what um, what lessons would you say you've learned from your time racing the tour of france at the highest level that you can sort of give to average cyclists to try and benefit from some of your experience and you know, le- uh, mistakes you've made and lessons you learned uh he you know speaking to a lot, a lot of my friends uh retired athletes that is cyclists who did the tour de france i think the the theme usually is that we trained too much we didn't give ourselves enough rest and we didn't eat enough those are like the three things right away. Uh, I mean, I would say majority of the riders that I wrote, raced with, if they look back in their career, they could say that 60 to 70% of the time throughout the season, they were overtrained or not giving themselves enough time to recover. Because at the time I raced usually 86, 87 days a year. And now you see the riders, what they're doing now, and they're bringing that the race days down by 20 to 30% easily and doing much more time in training camps and giving themselves at least to be in in control of what they're doing on a daily basis and not racing day in day out and traveling around um so i'd say yeah all the way down to the average cyclist if if you go hard go hard but if you go easy go easy there's so many times that we did something in between all the time and never really truly recovering and then nutrition what i was just explaining being under fueled makes absolutely no sense when you're on the bike. And it makes so much sense as I say it here today, but it'd be like trying to drive your car fast with no gas in it. It just, just not going to happen. Right. So I think that's a, that's another big aha moment that you won't necessarily going to, you're not going to put on weight, especially if you're going harder, um, just eat, eat a little bit less after the race. That's a pretty, uh, pretty solid advice. I think we can all uh, learn from. So you're yeah. not racing anymore. Obviously I hope you're still riding your bike. Unless you hung up the wheels completely. Yeah, no, I I I, uh, I retired and I w- moved back from Girona, Spain. I was there for 15, 16 years, wow, okay. and I went to Chicago. And then I wasn't riding my bike much at all. Um, that's where that's where I grew up, and that's where my wife grew up. And then moved down here to Greenville, South Carolina. And uh, George and Cappy dragged me down here. One of my old teammates, and then Bobby Julik, another one of my old teammates, lives here. And so we have a, a great group of people. And and now I got to keep up with George's son. That was this morning. <laughs> I mean, it's, it's brutal to have a 14 year old kick your butt, but that's, that's what's happening right now. Having a six foot kid who could rip your legs off. So that's my biggest impetus these days to ride my bike is not get dropped by Enzo. I guess he has to rely on a bit of cunning and tactics and the outsmarting. Oh, yeah. <laughs> exactly. He definitely needed to outsmart him. <laughs> Brent, um, we've got a few minutes left. I know you're involved with this new fitness app, Breakaway. Do you want to tell the viewers a bit about this and how they can benefit from it? Yeah, for sure. I mean, this was a, a great project that I got involved with with one of my old friends uh, that I used to ride and race with. And he, we stayed in touch over the years. I mean, this is 20 some years ago that we ride and race together. and. Uh, he used to make fun of me that I was a Peloton instructor 
And he's like, you know, what does your life come to? You told you're a total seller. You're doing thing classes, <laughs> and uh, all tongue in cheek, of course. And then he got a Peloton bike, and then he actually got fit by doing it because he moved to a colder climate. And he's like, well, how do? He's like, well, you're doing, you know, intervals for the first time since we were kids. Like, what? Of course, you're getting better. You're actually riding hard, and kind of to our conversation, ride hard when you should ride hard, and ride easy when you should. And and he's like, well, is it th- that easy? Yeah. I mean, he's like, yeah, training's really not that complicated. We complicate it, you know, in between our own ears all the yeah. time. And so we started just making this platform called a breakaway and really just making it for how we would like to see things, giving our, giving a little bit of guidance, giving a little bit of insight, um, making data un- understandable to the average person. What is a kilojoule? What's week over week progression? Um, you know, what do you, how do I stack up? So one of the coolest things when you, when you sign up to the breakaway, you we bringing all your data, whether it be from Pelotons, with Garmin, mm-hmm. Wahoo, up to a year, and tell you what kind of rider, what your strengths and weaknesses are, and what you how you compare to someone your age, first first and foremost, gender, and all the way down to watts per kilogram. So that's already been really cool, just immediately when you sign up for it. And then myself. I find myself riding a lot more and looking at what I'm actually doing these days because I don't know if I'm really going hard all the time or easy. I just kind of just wing it. But I mean, I'm not training for anything, but I still like to ride my bike and I still like to see if I'm making any kind of progression. I like to see where I was month over month. And um, yeah, so I, it's it's been a really fun uh, progression of what we've made. We're still early days and where are we going though? Uh, I, this has got legs here. So I'm yeah, please go check it out. I think we're actually going to give some of your viewers a couple months free. So um, at least to get started with. So yeah, please give it a shot. Yeah, sounds brilliant. Yeah, we'll put a link down below so you can find it more. But um, yeah, definitely one. If it makes training or no, riding a bike fast for fun, easier, I'm all, all on board with that. So um, last question before I let you go. Who can win a Tour of France this year? Or who's your <laughs> top three? Give us, give us three picks. Um, the podium. I, I mean... Right. As we sit here today, I don't see how as long as everything goes OK, of course, if he's fit, uh, Teddy Pagacha, it looks head and shoulders yet, yet again. I mean, yeah, he's true. had a, a great progression. He's so well-rounded, David. Everything he does is great. He's he's quick. He rides his bike with the best of them up and down hills on the flat. He, he showed himself in Tour of Flanders what he could do on the cobblestones. Truly not many flaws. I mean, we're talking about recovery. He's 22. How did you, you know, 22, 23, how did you recover when you're in, in university? So yeah, I, he, he's got it all right now. He doesn't have the strongest team, but does that matter? I mean, we have other teams with a, a lot of strong riders on it, but no one who could truly top him as far as I could see. Um, Jonas Vingugu is another one I'm really interested okay. to see how he do. He's got to get through the first you know, week or so of racing with, there's got a, a lot of hurdles there, a lot of pitfalls, of course, primos, we love to see him fighting. And then in my heart, I'm always pulling for Garen Thomas. I, I love the guy to death. Um, he showed himself last week in tour of Swiss. Um, so if he can be up there and consistent, he did a blazing fast time trial. He's got yeah. some two big time trials this year in the tour, um, could ride well in the cobblestones when he stays upright and he could climb well. So it's just, Again, it's it's a matter of can you match it the the ridiculous pace that some of these younger riders yeah. can do in the high mountains. Well, I'll definitely agree with Thomas if he doesn't crash that that is <laughs> finger cross. Yeah. Um, I can't say anything, man. I, I spent a lot of time on the floor myself, so I have no no reason to say anything about G. <laughs> Brilliant. There we go. Um, well, a pleasure to speak to you. Thanks for uh, sharing some of your insight into the Tour of France with us and how tough it really is. It sounds pretty hard. You haven't made it sound any easier at all. So um I'll definitely watching a race um with slightly different eyes uh having kind of chat to you. So yeah, thanks for your time and um I'll see you again my soon pl- hopefully. And my pleasure. I'm I'm looking forward to myself. Can't wait. Brilliant. So that I think you'd agree was a very interesting and insightful conversation with Christian Vanderveld about just how tough and demanding the Tour de France actually is from a rider who finished a career best of fourth place. If you want to find out more about the Breakaway app that he's involved in, there's a link to it down below and a special offer for all you lucky viewers and listeners. But that's all for today. There's more Tour de France coverage on this playlist right here. And don't forget to subscribe by hitting this button right here. That's all for today. Thank you so much for watching. I'll see you all again very soon.